Thank you. <clears throat> um, is the planet full? What a wonderful seminar series to be having at the moment. Uh, with all the hype that we've recently had around population, uh, and in particular, 7 billion worth uh, of population. And I think one of the things that struck me was how limited suddenly our knowledge in the public debate seemed to be about issues of population. Uh, a colleague of mine has a wonderful story of how he was working in Europe about 30 years ago uh, and was invited onto a government team to try and understand the ageing of their population. And the chair turned to him and said, tell me, where have all these old people come from? <laughs> and in a way, it was exactly the same with the hype around 7 billion. How did this happen? You know, did we know we were going to reach 7 billion? What are we going to do about it? Uh, in actual fact, yes, we've known for a long time we're going to reach 7 billion. Uh, and we've also had a lot of interest uh, in population. Indeed, for most of the 20th century, there was tremendous concerns about the growth in the population, about reproduction, about potential overpopulation. And then, at the turn of the millennium, or around about then, it started to fall off the agenda. And what I want to argue is that it's really important that we reinstate population back into that debate around environment and sustainability, and in particular, that we look at it with a new, fresh eye, which is in the light of the demographic transition. Because the demographic transition has told us for the last 250 years, although contested, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well, that yes, we are, if uh, the pattern is true across the globe, and it does seem uh, to date that it is, that we do have a time of mortality falling, population expansion, fertility falling. Uh, and if we can reinstate the demographic transition back into a sensible debate, which not only talks about size, but also talks about those other issues around 21st population, which is compositional change, density change, and distribution change, then I think we will be uh, able to produce a framework that is far more appropriate uh, with tackling this key question around whether the planet uh, is full. So in the paper today, one thing I will argue is that this focus on global increase has distracted us from a variety of realities. The reality that fertility is falling in most countries and that, in fact, we need to consider those where it is not, it distracts us from the far more significant population changes of the 21st century, which are those in composition and particularly age structural change, uh, those in density around things like urbanisation, and those in the new global distribution of the population, which leads from migration. And again, it's distracted us from the significant link of population and consumption and population and environment. So I'm going to draw on the work that we do uh, at the um, Oxford Institute uh, around this. In particular, uh, this, our CLAW uh, um, programme on population environment interactions, uh, which tries uh, to give new ways of understanding this interaction. But also the work we've done recently for Foresight, for their global environmental migration programme. Uh, I serve on the population, people and the planet uh, working group of the Royal Society, which is looking at exactly this question. What is the relationship between population and environment and how is it mediated by consumption? And the work that we've recently done for DEFRA, uh, looking at access to food in the light of a changing population. But I want to start by going back to this issue, um, and that is what happened to population? Why was it issues of reproduction were so important last century and yet then disappeared from the public agenda. Uh, so, 1928, the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population had its first conference. 46, the United Nations Economic and Social Council Population Commission was established. 54, the first UN World Population Conference. Uh, 65, um, we had the um, USAID established, UNFPA in 1969. Um, again, constant 1974, uh, we had the um, World Population Conference in Bucharest. The World Population Plan of Action recognised the interdependence of population and development. Uh, in 84 and 92, we had the two conferences in Mexico and Rio, where population was really up there uh, on the agenda. And in particular, in 92, we had the adoption of Agenda 21, where it was argued that to achieve sustainable global development, there had to be uh, an emphasis on population dynamics and their relationship to sustainability. And then something basically happened. Round about the millennium, population, and particularly reproduction and population, fell off the agenda. Uh, so the 2002 Johannesburg World Summit on Sustainable De 
development had no explicit mention of demographic factors. And the emphasis had shifted to poverty eradication, protection and management of the natural resource base, health and sustainable development. And most importantly, in 2000, in the Millennium Development Goals, population did not figure explicitly. There was nothing on reproduction and there was nothing on population ageing. In 2005, reproduction was reinstated uh, into uh, the second um, uh, agenda, uh, but the fact that it fell off then, uh, I think is something uh, that um, w has been significant. So why has there been this recent neglect in population and particularly around issues of reproduction? And, and I think probably there are a variety uh, of arguments. Some people argue that actually it was a complete shift away from population as the problem to climate change as the problem. And the fact that, of course, in some way population was causing changes in the climate was not enough to keep population uh, there as the primary uh, focus. Uh, without doubt, uh, in the US, the rise of the right, uh, who had funded a lot of family planning programs, particularly in Africa, uh, began to uh, cause money to be withdrawn from these programs. Uh, other people have argued that it was uh, emphasis on HIV AIDS, again in Africa, where money was diverted towards this issue rather than uh, towards family planning issues. But I think a, a very cynical view, but one that I think probably uh, underlies a lot of this, this public uh, policy negotiation, is that there was some kind of implicit uh, agreement between the North and the South, uh, in so much as the North was saying, we won't talk about overpopulation if you don't talk about overconsumption. And as a result, we then had a decade uh, of where the two really key issues around sustainability, uh, and issues around planetary uh, futures uh, have been dominated by growth in population and growth in overconsumption. So, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about something that I think is important, and that's the demographic transition. And because there are probably demographers here, before I uh, start having things thrown at me, of course there is a caveat that people have been arguing about the demographic transition now, uh, probably since it was first thought of about 250 years ago, uh, and in particular, there is a huge academic debate around the drivers of the demographic transition, why it occurs, when it occurs, and how it occurs. Uh, in so much as in the last year, we've had two papers written, one yet again saying the demographic transition does not exist, and a second one coming out at roughly the same time, uh, whereby everything in the 21st century can be tracked back to the demographic transition. So it is a huge debate, but I think there is general acceptance uh, that this kind of a process seems to occur. So to put it very simply, one can say that as humans economically develop, so first of all mortality goes down, and particularly infant and child mortality. Then there is a gap when there is an increase in the population, and then fertility goes down, and eventually uh, it stabilises. And we can say uh, from here that people tend to recognise uh, a series of stages. Uh, stage one, where you have very high uh, fertility, very high mortality, typically famine, a lack of sanitation, poor water, uh, conflict, poverty, etc. And think of uh, England pre-1780 and current day Ethiopia. You move into stage two, where we start probably through initially public health measures, improved food, water, sanitation, uh, mortality comes down, in particular uh, infant uh, mortality. Uh, and again, if you think of the UK uh, in the um, 19th uh, century uh, and um, uh, probably current Sri Lanka. The population increases quite dramatically and then birth rate starts to come down. And there's a huge debate as to why fertility starts to come down, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute. But obviously there is this growth of population uh, which we have been experiencing over the last 250 years in different parts uh, of the globe. Uh, so the birth rate starts to fall uh, and again, this is what we had in England uh, at the beginning of last century in particular, uh, and um, current day Uruguay. And then we have a settling uh, of the population at a relatively low rate, some baby bus, baby booms, but on a whole uh, quite stable at the bottom, which is current day UK uh, and uh, Canada. But as I say, other people have suggested that from the demographic transition, we have other very key changes in our population, uh, not only in terms of size, that's obviously that, that gap between fertility 
uh, mortality and fertility, but also in composition. Uh, and the argument there is that if you're going to have fertility falling and mortality falling, and mortality falling across the life course, it starts with infant and child, then across the life course, and now what we see in most OECD countries, tremendous extensions on lo of longevity as late life mortality uh, starts to fall. You're inevitably going to have an ageing of the global population. Uh, and this I'll talk about in a minute is, is what we're going through at the moment. Other people like Dyson have argued that urbanisation, that's a change in the density of the population, uh, are an inevitable outcome of the demographic transition. In other words, as populations expand, uh, so either in rural areas it causes them to move to live together in urban areas or you get an urban area creating in situ. And then finally, uh, changes in global distribution um, and that is something that I think is, is less well linked into the demographic transition, but I believe is fundamental to it when you look at what is happening here. So the changes in distribution that emerge in the demographic transition are because it goes across the globe at a particular rate. And therefore, you inevitably have a time lag. And the kind of global migration that we've seen over the last 100, 150 years has very much been related uh, to uh, the ageing of the North, uh, in particular, and they have exported economic capital to those countries of the South and in return have received human capital in the form of human migration. So size, composition, density and distribution I think is crucial to put back into the debate. So what I want to do is just look a little bit at size and in particular look at what I was saying a few minutes ago. Fertility is falling almost everywhere and it's really important that we come to terms with the kind of size of population that we eventually will have and that we uh, are able to understand the dynamics of what is happening in those places where fertility is still high. And then I will uh, round uh, the second half of the talk by looking at the interaction of size, composition, density and distribution in relation to the environment and consumption. So first of all, population size. Um, I think 7 billion is good. I think the fact that we probably are going to get to 10 billion maximum by the end of the century is also good. And that's because 25 years ago when I was first teaching demography, I was saying, how can we stop the world reaching 24 billion? Because at that time, that is what we were thinking about. And then because fertility started falling, uh, we hit uh, uh, projections which suggested we would arrive at about 12 billion by the end of the century. And now the UN projections have come down uh, to roughly uh, 10 billion. Uh, this, in fact, is uh, done by a colleague of ours, Wolfgang Lutz, who is um, a visiting professor at the Institute uh, on a European Research Council grant. And he is far more optimistic, in fact, than the UN. Uh, and he, for example, as you can see, taking the median, believes that we will hover just below nine uh, and then uh, flatten out. The UN projections uh, are slightly uh, higher than that. So the reason why population is coming down uh, is basically because of this. What we've done here is we have mapped total fertility rates, uh, taking the five-year period 2005 to 2010. And what you have to look at is yellow, because yellow is below replacement. Total fertility rate is the number of uh, surviving children per reproductive woman. And as you can see, in fact, huge areas of the globe, nearly all, well, all the OECD countries, large areas of Asia moving into Latin America are now below replacement. The lowest total fertility at the moment in the world is Hong Kong, not China, Hong Kong, less than one child per woman. Singapore, Korea is down to about 1.2. Thailand and Vietnam now have lower total fertility rates than the UK. This was something we simply didn't see coming. We knew that fertility was coming down. We knew that the demographic transition appeared to be moving in the 20th century into Asia and Latin America, but we didn't quite realize the pace at which it was happening. You also have to look at the brown colors because these are countries that are just hovering above replacement. In other words, with the exception of Bolivia, nearly all of Latin America is now at or below uh, um, re uh, replacement. Similarly, Central America almost, uh, and obviously uh, North America. And indeed, it is really only Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the red, where you still have more than four children, uh, that we have the kind of high rates of fertility uh, that can cause uh, concern from a growth uh, point of view. The blue is those uh, over three. And this clearly is linked into development. 
And what we've done here, and I hope you can see that, is we've actually put stipples, these little dots, on those countries that are under the UN definition least developed. And you can see they're now all exclusively in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I think there's a few over here uh, in Asia, around here. And in fact, we do actually have some least developed countries that seem to have very low um, uh, uh, fertility. But on the whole, where we have to concentrate is sub-Saharan Africa. And therefore, I think we can say that economic development in some way, whether it is mediated through public health and falling mortality, or through things like education, or through things like introduction of family planning, but clearly there is an economic relationship with the falls in fertility. And this is good because this means that we can actually focus on assisting those countries where there is a fertility problem and get away from the tremendous hype that still seems to be out there, where you have people in this country saying, we've got to reduce the fertility rate of the UK. The UK's fertility rate is currently about 1.8. That's actually quite high for Europe, but it's still well below replacement. So very simply, future fertility, uh, we can say most the more developed countries are all currently at or below replacement. The less developed countries, uh, on the whole, will fall to below replacement, definitely, they believe, by 2050. And there will be a convergence in fertility for about three quarters of the world's population. And only the least developed countries uh, are likely to remain high. So sometimes people become confused. If we are having such a world where we are having falling uh, fertility rates, why is population increasing? And this is to do with something called demographic momentum. Every baby girl that is born is a potential mother. And that is one of the reasons why countries believe they have to start acting quickly. Because if they are going to have four to six women, uh, baby girls are being born, that's four to six potential mothers. And even if those women only had one child, we still would get an increase in global population. And I think we also have to take another factor into account that in some regions, for the first time, we have population increase mediated more by increases in longevity than by fertility. In other words, it can be argued uh, that people are not demographically dying on time and are still remaining uh, in the population. But just some figures here. Uh, this is what the UN predicts, and again, it's median predictions, so obviously there is not any variance, but um, they uh, are very likely to, to be adjusted. Um, that currently Asia uh, has, um, by 2011, 57% of the 7 billion uh, are currently in Asia. Uh, that will fall up, uh, to 55%, although we'll have about 5 out of the 9 billion predicted for 2050. Uh, and Asia will then uh, fall to 4.5 out of the predicted 10 billion. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is where we're going to see the growth in population. Currently around about 800, uh, just under a, a billion. Uh, that's about 11% of the population. Uh, it is predicted to reach 2 billion by 2050 and 3 billion uh, by 2100. Um, and the whole of Africa will have about 3.6 billion, uh, Asia 4.5 billion, and they will comprise 80% of the world's population. And that is very likely to happen. The argument is that will the, the uh, demographic transition uh, occur in Africa in the way that it's occurred in other parts of the world? Uh, for example, here we have another... Uh, uh, example from Wolfgang Lutz, and you can see he actually, again, really believes in that fertility is going to fall, uh, and he is suggesting, in fact, that Africa is going to level out at 2 billion uh, rather than the 3 billion that the UN say. But on the other hand, you have Chamey, who's recently uh, written that if Africa's fertility remains unchanged, it will reach 3 billion by 2050, 15 billion by 2100, and comprise 68% of a 22 billion world. Uh, by the end of the century. I think this is uh, scaremongering and incredibly unlikely, but people are out there uh, uh, making those kind of projections. So, will fertility fall in Africa? In order to understand this, we really have to go back to understand the dynamics uh, of fertility fall. And basically, uh, there are three very broad camps. There's a group of people who argue that when mortality, particularly infant mortality, uh, starts to fall, there's this inevitability that women will uh, have uh, less children. And, and that argument is that if you're going to have uh, five, six, seven children and they're all going to survive, then you are going to have to uh, bring up and use resources uh, to um, 
uh, look after and bring up those um, children. And therefore, inevitably, women will cut back on their fertility. And Dyson is one of those demographers who very much believes in that. And he has written things like, like provided that all mortality decline occurs in a population, provided that mortality decline occurs in a population, then all of the transitions, other major demographic processes, will occur. It is possible for external factors to intervene and delay this process, but experience suggests that the delaying influence of any such factors is limited in the long run. And the central uh, chain of cause and effect appears to be both reasonably self-contrained and inexorable. Uh, and he believes that we are uh, dealing with processes that will be completed everywhere, including uh, in Africa. There's another group of people, and these are the people who believe in things around education, com uh, communications, uh, and uh, changes in norms. Uh, and these are represented in particular by people like Caldwell, who was writing in the, the 60s, Friedman in the 80s, and again, Wolfgang uh, Lutz. Uh, and so uh, people like Caldwell uh, look at education much more uh, in terms of changing people's mindsets in communications. Uh, for example, he says, much of the dramatic decline in fertility that we've witnessed in Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America over the past 40 years was the result of changing family size norms. Norms that changed in part as a result of the communication programs that were designed to change them. And people like Cord will have been very influential, uh, for example, in Kenya and in Ghana, where the governments have gone out with these communication programs, uh, trying to convince uh, uh, particularly women, but also uh, couples, that they have to have uh, less uh, children. And Friedman, similarly, idea, idea, ideational change has a powerful independent effect on fertility behaviour, uh, above and beyond what development itself brings. Lutz, however, and many of you may have heard him talking, uh, he uh, has done some uh, very sophisticated uh, quantitative analysis looking at the growth of education uh, across the globe, particularly female education, and the impact it's had on bringing down fertility. And this is one of his maps, uh, and in fact, if you just look at it at face value, you can say absolutely yes. Here we have more than 80% uh, of uh, women uh, who have uh, finished at least uh, sort of senior uh, junior education, and here we have a very low percentage, less than 20%. Here we have well below replacement fertility, here we have high. But in actual fact, the story is far more complicated than that. Is it that education is actually impacting uh, on things like public health, which is bringing down infant mortality, which is leading to fertility decline? Is it that education is enabling women to go out into the workplace and therefore they see children much more as a consumption good uh, rather than the actual norm of their life? Is it that education is teaching them about family planning? And I think it's quite important that, that we tease out some of those dynamics. For example, here uh, we have infant mortality rates by education and wealth in India, uh, and this is um, infant mortality rate. And if you look here, we have, uh, these are uh, poor and rich, and these are poor and rich, and you can see that infant mortality uh, is uh, dominating uh, by those who are in higher education. In both cases, it is the education uh, that seems to dominate. And we can see in exactly the same pattern uh, when we map uh, the same idea uh, uh, of the poor and rich low educated and the poor and rich high educated. Education seems uh, to be of importance in bringing down mortality. But I think this study probably to me is one of the more uh, convincing. Um, this is a, a, a study which came out of the demographic and health surveys uh, in these uh, three countries, Zimbabwe, uh, Benin and uh, Burkina Faso. And what we have to compare here is the dark lines up here for all three countries. And these are people who knew about the use of contraception. And you can see regardless whether it's no education, primary, uh, um, completing primary and completing secondary, there is huge knowledge about contraceptive use. These are take up of contraception. And very, very clearly, you can see that those people who are educated are far more likely to use uh, contraception, uh, regardless of knowledge. And that's a really important point, because one of the things that is often pointed out in the ethnographic work is that actually women across the globe know how to control their own fertility. And they have been able to control their own fertility uh, for some time. It's more about changing mindsets or giving them education that uh, enables them to do something else other than be mothers that seems to be uh, of importance. And that, I think, is why 
uh, the idea of a full education and health program uh, is of such importance. But I have to reflect that there is a, a group, for example, in particular uh, Malcolm Potts, uh, who are campaigning people about the unmet need for contraception. Uh, and they and, uh, work closely with organizations like UNFPA uh, to point out that there is a huge unmet need for contraception. Um, up to a quarter of women, they argue, in sub-Saharan Africa don't have access to contraception, and around about a fifth uh, in some of the other uh, Asian and um, Latin American uh, countries. Uh, and I think this is an overstated uh, issue, uh, but on the other hand, it, it, it is out there, uh, and these people are very influential in the public policy uh, debate. So before we go on to the uh, second half, which is going to look at this relationship between population, uh, uh, comp um, population consumption and environment, uh, I, I just wanted to take a little pause. I came back from Peru on Tuesday, and these are my holiday photos, so I thought we could... Um, um, and this is one of the things I was doing there, was looking at uh, an Andean program, which is about family planning. And Peru is a very interesting country, because in 1985, the government made a decision that it was going to introduce widespread family planning education uh, across both rural and urban areas. And to start with, uh, it was given out free in rural areas uh, and uh, people in urban areas had to pay, but in the mid-90s they took the decision to give free contraception. You may have heard there's quite a lot of controversy at the moment because the president is currently, uh, has been, um, I think he's actually still in jail or under arrest or whatever, uh, because part of that program was forced sterilization. Now, they argue that these women were aware that they were being sterilized, uh, but he is obviously um, being questioned about this. And, and sadly, this has rather tainted what I think was a, a, a very good uh, program. But what is of most um, interest here, and, and this is just an example of, these really are my holiday slaps. Oh, so for example, this family here, uh, who uh, these are uh, regularly um, in the community, will have two children, and yet they all um, have siblings of five, six, uh, and seven uh, children. And so, for example, in this particular community, this was the crucial uh, element, uh, that in 1990, a family planning centre was put into this rural community on the outskirts, uh, on, on the um, border between uh, Bolivia and Peru. And uh, the received wisdom from the policymakers is that this little family planning uh, group significantly reduced the number of children in the area. However, what you have to take into account is that in 1970, widespread female education up to 16 was introduced in Peru. So the very women who in 1990 suddenly were getting all this contraception, of course, were the first cohort that had been through full-time secondary education. And I think what is of also interest, uh, going back to this, is there an unmet need for contraception, is that these women had always been able to control their own fertility. They use a particular herb which uh, induces miscarriage, but it wasn't until I think they were educated and then in particular uh, the uh, men probably had access uh, to this uh, uh, small family planning centre in this particular community that they started to reduce uh, their fertility. So, for the last uh, 20 minutes I think or so, let's move on to the second half of the talk uh, which is about this, uh, the interrelationship between population, environment and consumption. And I want to draw here a lot on the material that's coming out of the Royal Society Working Group. We do not release our report until March, so unfortunately I can't, I'm not allowed to give you conclusions, but I think it's been a very interesting framework. It's one of the first times that we've had demographers, economists and environmental scientists spending two years really trying to tease out uh, this relationship. One of the frameworks that the group has used is this. This is the Rockstrom Planetary Boundaries. Now, I'm not an environmental scientist, but I understand in the world of environmental sciences, this is as con controversial as the demographic transition. Uh, but it was decided that actually uh, it was a very useful uh, framework uh, within which just to place uh, some of the material from an explanatory uh, point of view. What I want to do um, in terms of... Um, uh, looking at population size is some work that the Institute did uh, for the Royal Society around the idea of population and food consumption. And I know you had an excellent talk earlier in this series uh, by Charles uh, on this, but I thought it would be useful just to show you uh, some of the work that, that we had done. Um, 
And again, not to repeat it because I'm sure Charles uh, talked about this, but there is generally recognised that in terms of um, changing food, there is firstly an expansion effect uh, where we have increased energy supplies uh, and then we have a substitution effect where we seem to see a shift away from uh, the staples, the carbohydrate staples, over to more meat, dairy foods uh, and sugar. But also, I think we must recognise that as people move, uh, so their uh, habits will change. Urbanisation, there's quite a lot of evidence now that the calorie requirements of urban and rural residents, for example, differ. Of course, urban residents don't grow their own food. Uh, and uh, increases in income see changes in food consumption. And I think we're also beginning to realise that composition change, both in gender uh, and in age, alters uh, the kind of food consumption. Um, and this is just uh, simply just to remind you of the kind of thing Charles was talking about, which is this increase. Uh, this comes from the FAO, and it shows this is uh, 1961 across to 2005, and you need to concentrate here, which shows the increase uh, in um, particularly uh, meat and dairy products uh, at a global level. One of the things we did was to say, well, if we look at changing calorie consumptions, and if we also look at changing family size, uh, what can we say about the need uh, to produce food in the future. And it's very much an explanatory model just to demonstrate uh, the kind of scenarios that uh, we think should be um, increasingly considered. Because what we have at the moment, uh, I think, is very much two worlds. We have the world up here, um, which is the uh, higher uh, BMI world. And this is a group of people who are obviously uh, eating very high calorific foods, very demanding on the environment, and as a result, are giving themselves the kind of chronic diseases that I'm sure Robin uh, talked about you a couple of weeks ago. And then we have a second bit of the world uh, where they typically are not getting uh, enough calories and they also are leading to diseases, particularly of the immune system uh, and uh, inabilities to fight off uh, other disease through malnutrition. So what we've done here is we have taken WHO predicted calorie consumption and we've mapped it by UN predicted population growth. And we've done it just in this particular map for the developed countries here and for sub-Saharan Africa here. So you can see that the population is actually going to increase by 27%, but the calories, will o the, the calorie requirement will only increase by 28%. Uh, and this is if the WHO predicted calorie consumption change between 2010 and 2030, uh, came to pass. But what we then said was, uh, what happens if no one changes their calorie consumption? In other words, particularly the Americans keep eating huge quantities uh, of meat and dairy products, uh, and the Africans are in um, less than subsistence uh, uh, diets. And again, combining this with projected population, we can see an increase in 27 of population, but in fact our calories would only increase by 25. But what if sub-Saharan Africa took on diets of the more developed world. That is unlikely by 2030, but it's not unlikely uh, by 2050 unless we have real policy interventions. Then we might only have a population increase of 27% in these two groups, but the calorific requirement would be 45%. And then finally, in another scenario, OK, what if the whole world came down not to sub-Saharan Africa level, but to the levels of the less developed worlds, particularly Asia and parts of Latin America, and then although your population increased by 27%, your calorific growth would actually fall to 22%. So just a way in which bringing population into the debate uh, can create some interesting scenarios. The second thing, moving away from size, is around population composition. And I, I don't want to spend too much uh, time on this, but this basically is showing the percentage of the total population aged over 60 by 2050, and the way that the whole uh, world is going to have this age structural shift as fertility falls and mortality falls as well. So in other words, we get increased longevity. The ageing of the world population is actually being driven more by fertility fall than by increases in longevity. And if you look at the green, the blue and the red, then you have parts of the world where over a third of their population will be over 60, uh, where a quarter of their population will be over 60, and here, uh, where over 20% will be over 60. And again, I don't want to spend too much time on this because clearly one of the really big issues is what I presume Robin was talking to you about, which is the increase uh, in chronic disease, which to a certain extent is going to be inevitable uh, with this. But I also want to uh, show you some quite interesting work that has, has come out 
where people have taken a structural change and started to link it into some of the environmental models. Uh, the very famous one is Brian O'Neill, who started this about three or four years ago in a rather unsophisticated way. But I think this work, which has recently come out of the University of Victoria by Liddell, is actually far more uh, convincing. So just to give you an example of, of two of the, the models, what he's done here is he's taken projections from 2010 to 2050 uh, of carbon emissions from transport using OECD figures. And he has taken it uh, without age structure, which is what you normally see, but then he's redone it, putting in age structure. And what he argues is that carbon emissions for transport will fall in OECD countries due to the changing age structure of the population. Now, the one problem that I have with this is that when he's talking about age structure, he's going to 2050, and he is taking 65 as some form of cutoff, as though everybody in 2050, when they get to 65, leave the labour market and go and spend their entire time at home. Um, that is highly unlikely, and one of the things that the Institute that uh, we are planning to do is actually do slightly more sophisticated work using his model, because I think it's a very good model, but at least it's a beginning to try and bring those age compositional changes in. He's done a similar thing, uh, which is looking at uh, residential electricity consumption. And here, when you put age structure in, it actually goes up. And part of this links into a, a, another piece of work that we are uh, putting together with the University of Cambridge, uh, with their Department of Architecture and Building Physics. Because as we get older, our abilities to regulate our temperatures go down. And one of the things that our Building Physics friends have uh, told us, which we were not aware of, and they were not aware of this temperature change, is that most of the models for predicting both heating and, in particular, future cooling of buildings have not taken into account the full range of temperature control that will be needed as populations, particularly in urban areas, uh, age. The next one is population density, and people tend to think about increases in urban population, and here are just some simple uh, models looking at between 1950 and 2005. Uh, and basically here you have more or less the developed world and here you have uh, the less developed world. But you can see that there has been a steady increase in people living in urban environments. Uh, by 2010, we became basically an urban globe. Just over half our population lived in registered urban areas. That will increase uh, to 69%. That's nearly heading for obviously three quarters of the world population by 2050. And of course, there's been a lot of interest recently in these, what they call urban agglomerations. Uh, and Tokyo currently, with nearly 37 million people, that's more than a quarter of its population, uh, is the biggest urban agglomeration. But you can see that there is a group down here, Karachi, uh, with 13 million people. And there's been a lot of debate around the impact of urbanization on the environment. But again, it's very much polarized. There are those people who are looking particularly at things like squatter settlements, who are looking at local ecosystem destruction and are suggesting that urbanisation is very negative for the environment. And then there's another group of people, particularly those who work in things like environmental services, who are suggesting that it is far easier to deliver such services in an urban structure, <coughs> that you have energy uh, uh, requirements going down. The family planning people have pointed out it's far easier to reduce population and fertility in an urban environment. So whether urbanisation is good or bad for the environment, uh, I think is very much debated. So what I want to talk about in this section is something that we're doing in the Institute, which is about the other side. We have changing population density, increased urban, uh, but we also have a reduction uh, in those living in rural areas, and increasingly there is a compositional change in so much as they tend to be older. And this is, a, a, I think, a really interesting piece of work that we've just done the first part of, which is looking at the ageing of the farm population. Uh, and, in fact, from the, the figures we have at the moment, 50% of Hungarian farmers over 50, 26% of American farmers, these are active farmers, not owners, and 60% of Japanese farmers now aged over 65. And there are a variety of national governments who are beginning to highlight this as a source of concern. Uh, just to give you a few examples, and you can read this, uh, the UN uh, Commission for Latin America and the, Cam the Caribbean, the impact on the farming economy of the ageing population is considered to be detrimental. 
Uh, this tendency has led to concerns in policy circles that an ageing population is less likely to be able to compete and remain viable uh, within emerging 21st century food supply changes. There are also concerns that a low rate of entry into farming will ultimately lead to fewer numbers of farmers, which will have profound implications on the production of food. Uh, for example, in the US, the dairy industry in Wisconsin has been raised as a, a key area of concern by the US government. In the UK, the Policy Commission for the Future of Farming and Food uh, uh, identified the difficulties of entry and exit to farming as a fundamental obstacle to restructuring the UK farming industry. Um, so in other words, this relationship between density, consumption, composition and productivity, uh, why is it seen that older farmers uh, are in theory hindering uh, food uh, production? Uh, a barrier for rural development, less open to innovations, modern technology, less equipped for a competitive integration into the market economy, it's been argued that there will be a reduction in the productivity of land and rural development, especially food production. Uh, older farmers have the least capacity to manage shocks, but they're mostly uncovered by risk management. Uh, it's argued that they're less able to meet volume, quantity and consistently requirements of an increasingly dominant supermarket chain and large scale agro processors uh, and uh, intergenerational transfers and loss of uh, rural human capital. I think this is a really interesting um, area and as I say in particular DEFRA are very interested in this uh, WHO interestingly are also uh, interested in this but the data we have is very very weak we have a few data sets we may know how many elderly farmers are but at the moment we don't know what percentage of food is produced by them uh, and this is why we have a, a, a collaboration with actually Help Age International at the moment to try and do a much bigger uh, uh, um, study hopefully uh, funded by DFED to look into this. So just coming to the end now, uh, the uh, final category is population and distribution. In other words, how does that big change in 20th century distribution of population relate to consumption and the environment? Uh, and I just wanted to put this up. I'm actually indebted to Sarah uh, Spence here from uh, Campus who alerted me to uh, this uh, work by Vargas Silva. Um, because within the migration literature, apparently it is very much recognised that migration leads to both changes in consumption uh, of the host country and changes in the consumption uh, of the source uh, country. But I wanted to uh, finish this section by talking about the work that I've just completed for Foresight for their global environmental migration study. And what I was really interested in uh, was this whole idea around environmental migration and how it linked into what in my world uh, was called economic uh, migration. Uh, and I'm looking at this very much from a policy point of view and not from a decision-making point of view of the migrants. And the argument there basically is that, uh, as I said, as populations differentially age, uh, so there is a desire by those ageing countries they see they have their own personal demographic deficit because their working age population is not being replaced and therefore they're sucking in uh, human capital in the form of migration. But what has become very clear, and the World Bank uh, in 2005 raised concerns about this, manpower in a recent study have also raised concerns, is that Europe is simply not going to be in a position to attract the skills that it requires going forward and that by 2020, Europe is going to face quite a dramatic skill shortage. And this argument is that because of falling fertility in Latin America and Asia, these countries uh, are going to retain their own skills, and particular, particularly China uh, is one of the few countries that has mapped its occupational structure by age. It knows that which year it's going to have an occupational downturn in skills, and it's going to start cherry-picking in the same way that we did. Um, and as a consequence, Europe is really uh, going to uh, miss out on this. So in other words, as Holtzman in 2005 pointed out, the European share of the global working age population has fallen from 25% in 1950 to 9% in, uh, predicted by 2025. And what they have suggested, in fact, is that Asia in particular is going to start taking uh, the world's skills. However, if one puts into the picture uh, the argument around what is happening in terms of climate change uh, in Asia and Latin America, there is this counter-argument that actually, although these cities at the moment may look like good economic uh, magnates, they are the very cities 
that are likely uh, to be affected by flooding, uh, by shocks, uh, and by other aspects uh, of climate change. So economic growth in the Asian coastal cities will be reduced through the impact of climate change. Um, Asian cities, which under the World Bank scenarios provide future new magnets attracting skilled migrants, may begin to lose out to European cities, which are situated in less environmental challenging zones. So this whole project was to try and put these two worlds uh, together. And basically to say, what is the impact of global ageing on environmentally driven migration? And that is that, in fact, there will be an increased demand for global skills, and thus those in environmentally challenged zones, particularly in the south, with skills may find it easier to relocate. And the second part of the project was, what is the impact of environmental change on deficit migration or economic migration? And the World Bank scenario overlooks the probability that according to current climate predictions, many northern and western European countries will provide an environmentally attractive location within which to live. So this just gives you an example of how you can start being creative in putting ideas around changing composition and distribution uh, and uh, migration together in a changing uh, environmental world. So just to conclude, the relationship between population, consumption and environment. One of the key things that this working group, Population of the Planet, we started very much looking at population and the environment and almost immediately realised we had to look at consumption. And we believe it was really, it is really about changing consumption. And I think, although uh, these are my own thoughts and, and not necessarily uh, of the Royal Society yet, we have to say consumption is going to increase. We are going to go from 7 to 10 billion, and it is highly unlikely that we will not hit either just below or at uh, 10 billion. 3 billion more people on this planet means that we are going to have increased consumption of resources. Uh, the world's population has doubled in my lifetime. It was 3.5 billion when I was born. So... That is something we have to face. In addition, we're going to have to need to raise the living standards of the least developed countries unless we want the kind of inequality uh, that we heard about uh, last week, uh, uh, where we have three billion people who are basically malnourished, starving, famine, lack of access to resources. But probably one of the key areas is going to be these middle-income countries that are going to be growing very rapidly from a population point of view, even though their fertility has uh, gone down. Uh, both demographically but also economically. And I think another important issue is that it's very, very clear, I think, that in order to reduce the fertility of particularly sub-Saharan Africa, but also some of these other uh, countries in Asia, we're going to need to increase health and education, and that is a form of consumption. So in order to reduce population increase, we're going to have to increase uh, consumption in the health and education uh, arena. And I think one of the things we haven't come to terms with in the north is how do we uh, reduce affluence uh, here uh, in Europe uh, and in North America. And I think there is an argument that we're having a population that is becoming increasingly uh, beginning to buy into the idea that consumption in the terms of goods maybe is something that we have to reduce. I think it's going to be extremely difficult, however, in the light of our ageing populations and the new technologies to reduce health consumption. It's going to be very difficult for any government to say to a population over the next 20, 30 years, we have got these new advanced technologies, we've got this new pharma, these new drugs, we've got new stem cell research, new genetics, we can help you live long, healthy lives, oh, but we can't because of the environment, because we must cut down consumption. So I think there's some huge ethical questions around health and education, which in a civilised society we need for ourselves uh, and we need... Uh, for uh, populations in the South. So to finish, is the planet full? I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>